Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's live session of the Hindu newspaper analysis. As you know, every single day at 10 a.m. we bring this session live for you to analyze the day's Hindu newspaper by dissecting the most important news stories from both the mains and the prelims examination point of view. Also reminding you once again, although almost all of you have become a part of the Telegram channel, but still, if you are one of those who are not a part of the channel, please use the link given in the description of the video. Be a part of our Telegram channel. You will be notified about all the new initiatives. And also, as soon as this session ends, we have a live quiz based on these topics that we discuss right on our Telegram channel. So you can attend that quiz and make sure that you revise everything that you study here. Now, without any further ado, let's see what are the topics we have taken up for today's discussion. These are the topics that we'll be discussing today, starting with an article in the editorial about India's food insecurity problem. So there's a report recently published by the FAO. That report talks about the food insecurity issue all around the country and also in other parts of the world. It talks about different regions, what is the say, status of food security or insecurity in Asia, Africa, Europe, etc. And it also highlights some of the very, very problematic things about India. It is filled with a lot of data. We'll be dissecting that. Second topic we'll be discussing is the made in China smartphone story. So this is mainly a news regarding semiconductor chips. As you know, multiple nations around the world are in a race and they're trying to develop the most advanced semiconductor chip possible. China and US specifically are in this race. The Chinese company, Huawei, recently announced that they have a breakthrough and they now are using a 7 nanometer chip. 7. We will be discussing the reality of this claim and where does China and US stand and what is India's stand in this semiconductor story. Third, we will be discussing an economic concept that is the Grisham's law. We will be discussing what exactly is Grisham's law, what is it related to, how does it impact the national currency with comparison of the global currency. Fourth, we'll be discussing the West Asia Economic Corridor, one of the biggest takeaways of the G20 summit. India, Middle Eastern countries such as Saudi Arabia and UAE and the G7 coming together to launch an all new economic corridor that is being seen as a competition to the Chinese BRI. Then from the prelims point of view, a couple of new stories. First, the Supreme Court's constitutional bench has given a very, very important judgment with regards to the powers of the CBI, especially to prosecute senior level officers. So we'll be discussing what that is, what are the powers of the CBI, mainly with respect to senior level officers in the government of India. And in the end, we saw the announcement of CSIR's Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award, one of the topmost scientific awards in India. We'll be discussing who won the awards and a bit of detail about the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award as the unit. Let's begin with the very first article. The first article, as you can see on the screen, is about India's food insecurity. In simple terms, food insecurity means when a part of a population or a large part of your population does not have enough food on the plate or if you have to analyze it even deeply, the population does not have enough nutritious food on the plate. The nutrition in the food is missing. Now, there are two reasons because of which this might happen. Number one, maybe the food quality itself is not good. The food that is available in the market, maybe that just does not have the nutrition. Or on the other hand, the other problem is maybe it is unaffordable. Maybe a large part of the population just cannot afford to have nutritious meal. In India and most of the developing world, the problem is the second one, the unaffordability. The author here says that if you look at the food inflation in India, it has been rising drastically since 2019. Since 2019, the prices of almost everything that we eat on a day-to-day -day basis have been increasing sharply. And that means... A large part of our population may be able to afford meal, but not a nutritious meal. You might argue 
that isn't the government running a lot of these programs where the government is distributing free food grains. We have the National Food Security Program, then there are different state governments that promise free food grains, the packaged food, etc. But even then the problem has persisted. And it is not just the FAO because usually what happens when you have an international report criticizing India's standing, we usually say, oh, this is a foreign conspiracy. They don't want to show India in a good light. But the problem is, if you even look at the data from India's own National Family Health Survey, that data also tells you a similar story. So rather than blaming the FAO or any international agency or a foreign hand for the picture that they are showing, the reality is the same picture, the same facts have been corroborated by our own national report that is in the National Family Health Survey. Now, where do we go from here? The author here is comparing India's era of the time of the Green Revolution. The author says that India has gone through the time where we just did not have enough food to bring to the plates of our population. Thankfully, now we are not in that situation. India exports a large amount of agricultural commodities. Maybe it is time to bring back another version of the Green Revolution. The difference being, <clears throat> the earlier Green Revolution was mainly focusing on cereals, rice, wheat, etc. Maybe this time, the time is to focus on much more nutritious meal. The backdrop or the backbone of this entire article is this report called the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, published by the FAO, that is a Food and Agriculture Organization. The headline that is an extremely heartbreaking headline for India specifically is that in India in 2021, 74% of our population cannot afford a healthy meal. 74%. Now imagine if you calculate this number on the basis of India's current population, let's assume India's current population to be 1.4 billion. And if you try and calculate 74% of this, means close to a billion people in India are not able to afford a healthy meal. Now, it gets even worse and I'll tell you how. It gets even worse because similar report also says that the cost of a healthy meal in India is one of the lowest in the world. So it's not that the healthy meal in India is now costing so much that people can't afford it. Even though the cost of a healthy meal in India is one of the of most affordable in the world, even then we are just not able to afford a healthy meal to be put on three-fourths of our population. As I said, similar things have been pointed out in our own National Family Health Survey. National Family Health Survey says over 50% of adult women in India are estimated to be anemic. You would have seen how the government of India has been focused a lot on anemia. Anemia Mukt Bharat we have been talking about. That is because we also understand that this fact may be a bit ballooned. You might say this is a bit exaggerated. But the reality is if 74% is not true, 0% is also not true. Even if you take a lump sum figure in between 50%, 60% or 40% people are not able to afford an affordable meal, even that is a huge number. So even if you don't believe 74%, this number is extremely high. We began this discussion by saying that one of the big problems is the inflation in the food. Since 2019, inflation has been increasing. Now you all know, in India, which authority has the primary responsibility to control inflation? That is the RBI. If you look at the mandate of the RBI, one of the primary responsibilities that they have is to control inflation. Because of which, they deliver policy rates, they tell us what, what is the policy rate, they make changes whenever they have these meetings. You would have seen in the past few months, the loan interest rates have been continuously increasing because the RBI thinks that by stopping supply of money into the market, maybe they will be able to control the inflation. Because at the end of the day, simple economics says that if there's too much money in the market, maybe there is inflation. That is the cause of inflation. 
but in reality rbi has not been able to bring down the inflation in the target the inflation targeting has been missed over the years and food inflation especially maybe because the problem is not having too much money in the market inflation as you all know as good students of economics i hope there are two ways in which inflation may be seen in the society one there may be too much money flowing into the society there may be too much free capital the other side of why inflation may be seen is there may not be enough supply in the market maybe the production is not that much as per the author the problem in india's inflation is always on the supply side the problem in india's inflation is never that we have too much money in the market the problem is always that the supply is not adequate so rbi just by changing the rate of interest will not be able to solve the problem if you really have to solve the problem you have to focus on the supply side meaning that you have to improve the capacity of the farmers thus he is arguing maybe it is time that the government puts its head together and focus on bringing another green revolution now i'm sure all of you are very familiar with the idea of green revolution introduced in india 1960s at a time when india was mainly dependent on foreign powers such as the us for our food grains and even the most basic agriculture stuff that is the time that india introduced green revolution by changing the variety of seeds making sure the farmers are better trained introducing high yielding seeds introducing better credit facility for the farmers making sure the government buys at a fixed price from the farmers to give them more encouragement although it made india self sufficient in terms of food and we are self sufficient even today but the problem is it focused so much on the cereals rice wheat rice wheat that we forgot the fact that a nutritious meal a balanced diet as you call it focuses on a lot of other micronutrients as well as per the author the government has to make sure that we once again focus on improving the health of the farm sector focus on improving the health of the farmer you would have seen recently the tomato prices were through the roof and there were so many news stories coming in this farmer has become a karodpati this farmer has become a karodpati but the reality is these are only a handful of the farmers in most cases even if you are paying 150 rupees per kg for tomatoes you know the farmer at the bottom of the chain would not be getting more than 15 20 rupees per kg it is a middleman in the middle who are holding all the stuff and getting most of the money so even when the prices increase every year you see onion prices increase or prices of other commodities increase ginger etc please don't assume that the high prices you are paying or paying out of your pocket is going directly into the pocket of the farmer that is not happening there is a large chain of middlemen in between who are taking the advantage and this happened in this case with the government has to now address as per the author as per the author government also should focus on increase irrigation that has always remained an issue in india farmers who live in river fed areas live in areas where there are canals nearby they are fine but a lot of farmers do not have enough water for irrigation we also need to focus on giving more funding to agricultural research if you are in delhi you may be familiar with an institute called pusa p u s a if you are not i would highly suggest you to see and search a bit about it pusa is an agricultural research institute that we have in fact it's pretty uh, it's in karolbagh itself in new delhi it has been a premier research institute for different type of agriculture variety agriculture species so they are the ones that undertake research and experiment of how to improve the yield of certain crops which chemicals or fertilizers to use and not to use this funding has to be improved also earlier we used to have a concept of gram sevak in villages who used to be trained by the government authorities and they would act as transfer of knowledge or transferer of knowledge to the farmers that concept also has become pretty obsolete most of the cities now do not have these gram sevaks this is again an idea that we should bring back as per the author 
Now, this is a graph that was not published in today's Hindu newspaper. This was published on this report only that we are discussing, the FA report, about a week back. About a week back when the FA report actually came out, this was a graph published. Now, in this graph, if you actually see, it's pretty interesting. See the first. It, the first chart shows the cost of healthy diet in terms of PPP dollar per person. As you can see here, India's healthy diet is not very costly. If you compare to countries, even Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iran, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan. So the cost of a diet is not very high. Even then, if you have 74% of our population who is unable to afford it, that means there is something extremely, extremely wrong happening here. Trying to curb inflation, thinking or assuming there's too much money in the market is not the right approach as per the author and the RBI must look into that. I also wanted to share with you some of the other findings of this report called the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World. As I said, the report by FAO is not only focused on India, it's a global report with some focus on India. So it talks about the global hunger that has increased over the years especially in the past three, four years due to pandemic, weather shocks, conflicts, the lack of nutrition has been seen all around the world, even child malnourishment has become a reality. We are also seeing a very interesting pattern that is urbanization. Means a lot of people are moving from rural areas to the urban areas, not just in India, but in countries around the world. The impact of this is as you move in the urban areas, your habits change you don't do as much physical labor as you used to do so most of the people end up becoming overweight obese and that also becomes a problem because overweight obesity is also an indication that you are not having a balanced nutritious meal the report also focuses on africa which as expected has a large population which is unable to afford a healthy diet that is 85 percent of it in fact, Asia and Africa together have accounted for 92% of global increase in these numbers. The report also says that 2050, 70% of our global population will reside in the cities and thus we need to be very careful about the patterns of eating and daily lifestyle that people adopt in the urban areas. Now, India's specific findings in this report Number one talks about the cost of healthy diet in India, as I said, which is pretty low, lowest amongst the BRIC nations and even amongst our neighbors, one of the lowest. If you look at the global comparisons, again, although the cost is very low to afford a healthy diet in India, even then almost three fourths of our population is unable to afford a healthy diet. This is such a big contrast. And this is not just about India. It's a contrast that you see in most developing countries. That on one hand, you are trying to achieve something big at the global stage. At one hand, you're trying to spend a lot of money, invite guests, show them your own diversity and culture. But on the other hand, you still have problems that have to be addressed. It doesn't really mean that the government only should focus on addressing this problem and forget about a global stature. No, both have to go hand in hand. You can't blame the government by saying, oh, at a time that so many people are hungry, you're focusing on G20, having that expenditure, because it has to go hand in hand. This is how the governments work around the world and not just India. And we have to support this kind of view. Next article. From social justice, we are now jumping into science. The article is based on a recent report that came out from China. Chinese big telecom manufacturer Huawei just announced that they have now started to use 7 nanometer semiconductor chip. Now, for those who don't know, I'll tell you the very simplest method of understanding this. Semiconductor chips are right now the most important component of every electronic device. Your phone, your car, your AC, your fan, the camera, the laptop, the tab, whatever you are thinking of, all of these have some chips. The simplest idea is the thinner the chip, the more efficient it is, as simple as that. So the thinner it is, the lesser this number is, the more advanced that chip is. 
Imagine the TVs that we used to have during our childhood, those big CRTs, and now look at the thickness of the monitor. Every single year, thickness of the monitor, laptop, phones is decreasing. How is that possible? Because of this chip. So the thinner the chip, the better and the more advanced it is. As simple as that. Anything below 10 nanometer is very good. Almost at the top of the world. Anything below 10 nanometer, extremely, extremely advanced. China has now announced that they have been able to successfully make 7 nanometer chip. Now this has caught the world's attention. Why? We talk about the US-China rivalry, about Taiwan, South China Sea, so on and so forth. But one extremely important area where US and China have a rivalry is the semiconductor chip market. Both the nations know that whoever controls or dominates this market will dominate the world of technology in the coming years. So USA does not want or do not want the Chinese to go ahead with this. US knows that most of the advanced companies working in this field are American companies. So Joe Biden and before him Donald Trump also, they have passed multiple orders that have banned export of chip technology from US to China. Most advanced US chip companies are not allowed to export their technology from US to China. They want to make sure that the Chinese are not able to make these chips. So Chinese are kind of left alone that they have to now do it all by themselves. And they have been able to still come up with a 7 nanometer chip which is extremely, extremely impressive. This is announced by Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp. This is the... Chinese company again announcement of 7 nanometer chip is extremely extremely advanced now the author here is saying although 7 nanometer looks very impressive if you just look at the headline oh 7 nanometer chip very impressive but as per the author the reality is something different the author says if you look closely China will not go very far China still has many issues in this what are the issues Let's see. First issue, the technology that the Chinese are using is not very, very efficient. In order to make these semiconductor chips, you have these circuit boards over which you will have to make the designs and then you have to integrate the entire circuit on it. The technology is mainly called lithography. Lithography is a technology that has to be used. Now, as per the author, if you look at how China has been using this technology, they are not very efficient. Because this technology, the semiconductor chip technology, apart from making or apart from having a lot of investment, the other problem in this semiconductor chip manufacturing is it requires a lot of water supply. This is one of the reasons why India has been struggling with setting up these manufacturing chip industry. Apart from billions of dollars, it also requires huge water supply. The more efficiently you use this water, the better it is. As per the author, if you look at the use of China, use of water by the Chinese, the efficiency is way less than 50%. On the other hand, the world leader in this ship technology, it is Taiwan. Taiwan's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, when they made a similar 7 nanometer chip, they were able to have water efficiency of over 90%. What does it mean? It means that even though Chinese may have been able to manufacture this chip, they will not be able to do it at a large scale. Why? Because doing it at a large scale requires much more water and they will not be able to afford this, number one. Secondly, as I said, because Americans have imposed multiple restrictions on these companies, not allowing them to transfer technology to China, the problem is China is now using tools which are not extremely advanced. Although they are trying their best, but they will not be able to scale it at a very, very large scale. It's like saying, I can also make a car better than Tesla at my home. But can you make thousands of such cars at a price that everyone wants? No. 
this is where big company this is where supply chain this is where all this technology comes into the picture just making one to show to the world see i can do this doesn't really make any sense if you really want to show your capability to the entire world you have to have the capability to produce this and replicate this at a much much larger scale the rivalry between the us and china is now forcing the chinese to think twice about how are they going to make these chips at a larger scale there are certain advantages that the us has as per the author there are three big advantages first big advantage us is not doing it all alone see having these semiconductor chips it's a very long process someone has to make the chip then you make the design then you integrate it everything has to come together it's a big supply chain so what us is doing is they are collaborating with multiple countries for example there is netherlands that produce the lithography tools then we have japan that manufacture these materials taiwan south korea they fabricate all of them come together with the us to actually have the finished product because each of these countries is threatened by china because none of these have a great relationship with china china is forced to do it all alone so for china the problem is from the start to the finish they are doing it all alone second problem in the us because there are multiple countries coming together the huge cost of investment in this industry is also divided the us alone does not have to bear the entire cost with china because there is no other friend or partner that they see with themselves so they would have to now bear the entire cost of this ecosystem that is also going against them third big issue the us attracts much more talent from around the world see the number of indians or asians generally who go and settle in us or european countries for a better future we are so proud of the fact that a lot of people from the indian lineage are the leaders of the topmost technology companies in the us that means us is a much larger ground for international talent coming in and trying their luck and now contributing to this field china on the other hand does not have so much international talent coming in because of a lot of restrictions think about yourself you're given a chance to lead a life better than what you're having here where will you go or where would you like to go and settle would like to go and settle in us or in china obviously us a more liberal more open country would be your choice and this is happening here as well this is why as per the author yes the breakthrough announcement by chinese company huawei of 7 nanometer chip deserves lot of applause but in reality if you see beyond this news we should not expect a lot of progress from china in this regard because china will be stuck somewhere because of the restriction that us has imposed now enough of talk about us and china let's talk about our own country where do we stand you have seen the government talking a lot about the semiconductor chip industry in the past few years there have been multiple private sector companies thinking of setting up these ventures the problem with this industry is it is extremely extremely capital expenditure heavy you require billions and billions of dollars of investment just to get going apart from the water and skills and everything else required so it's a tough industry to begin in however the government has made certain efforts for example india semiconductor industry in 2022 was 27 billion dollars the sad part is over 90% of it is imported thus we are thinking of now trying to be more self sufficient we mostly import from china taiwan us japan etc because of the huge consumption patterns in india see the simple idea is the government of india is asking the companies to make mobile phones in india just an example now these mobile phones require chips from where would you get these chips you will ask china or taiwan or usa to get them to india so the problem is even for india's make in india mission even for the government to now get companies to manufacture in india they will have to make sure that these chips are available in india otherwise the entire idea of make in india 
would defeat its entire purpose. We are expecting our own consumption of semiconductors to be above 80 billion by 2026. And if we keep importing it at the pace where we are, it's going to hurt us immensely and that is why we are expecting or hoping that we should be self-sufficient in this regard. Apart from that, the government of India has allocated some money. In 2021, the government announced $10 billion PLI scheme to encourage companies to come and manufacture in India, the semiconductor chips especially. The government has also announced a design linked incentive scheme to give more incentive and encouragement to the local domestic companies working in this field. We have also been trying to get more money into this by setting up semiconductor fab. Fab means fabrication. Semiconductor fabrication labs in India, display fabrications in India. I'll tell you a very interesting fact. The displays that we have, display of your mobile phone, your laptop, your tablet, your TV, around the world, there are very few companies that actually make good quality displays. Even your smartwatch, everything right now has a display. And these displays are one of the most demanded commodities in the world. And very few companies can actually make it because setting up a display manufacturing itself is extremely expensive and extremely, extremely challenging. So if you're looking for a business idea, maybe to take it to Shark Tank, maybe this is the way to go. So make sure that you understand how the government has been trying to push this sector. Next, we jump on to economics. The next article is about something called the Grisham's Law. Grisham's Law, in simple terms means if the government of a country artificially fixes the exchange rate of their currency, it will lead to bad money pushing out the good money. I will repeat. In simple terms, if the government fixes the interest rate of their own currency, it will lead the bad money pushing out the good money. Let's try and explain this or understand this with a very simple basic example. Right now, one dollar is, I have not checked the exact price, but let's say equal to 83 rupees. It's between 83, 84 these days. Let's assume 83 rupees, okay? Now let's assume the government of India <coughs> says that, oh, 83 is too much. I don't want 83. Our currency has to be much stronger. So let's say our government says that we are ordering that in India, one dollar should be only 25 rupees and not more than that. Let's say it's a government order. Now, what will happen as a result of this? As a result of this, as per the Grisham law, bad money, bad money means a currency that is and by dollars. So I go to someone who has hundred dollars and I tell this guy that please give me hundred dollars. I will give you the exchange rate. Exchange rate is 2,500 rupees for $100. Do you think the person will give me $100? No, he will not give me the dollars. Why? Because he knows his currency is being undervalued. Why will he give me the dollar? He will now store as much dollar or hold as much dollar with himself as possible. He will try to smuggle this out of the country. He will try to now take this dollar as much as possible out of India and sell it there. So what is happening? You are pushing dollar out of the country. You are pushing it out of the market. So good money, reliable money is being pushed out of the market. And bad money, which you are overvaluing artificially, is flooded in the market. This is called Grisham's law. In simple terms, that when the government deliberately fixes the value of its currency and overvalues it that no, 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 our money is much stronger. Then what will you do? A result will be that good money will be forced out of the market and bad money will float in the market. This is in simple terms called the Grisham's law. If you want to remember just one line, bad money drives out the good money. Whatever I explained by giving this example, this is written right here. That is why most countries around the world, 
including India, have a free floating currency rate in the market. As I just said, dollar is 83, 84, some, somewhere in the middle of it. How do I know this? And how does it keep changing? It keeps changing depending upon the demand and supply in the market. That's why I don't remember. If it would have been fixed by the government, I would have remembered, oh, this is the amount of money that you will get in exchange of $1, which is not the case because it is free floating. So most currencies around the world, including India, has an exchange rate that is freely floating. It is dependent on the supply and demand of the currency. The more is the demand of the currency, you will see that the price of the currency will increase automatically. The lesser is the demand, the prices will come down. And this is how it will be determined. As per any economic thinker, that is the best way for a country and the country's economy to be stable, to attract more investment. Leave your currency to the market. Let the market decide the fair value. The government should not interfere because when they interfere, that now creates a problem as per the Grisham law. Real example of this, the example that I gave you was seen in Sri Lanka just recently. So you know Sri Lanka along with Pakistan was going through this huge economic crisis, their currency was going downhill. So Sri Lankan central bank announced that wait, our currency that is Sri Lankan rupee cannot be sold at more than 200 rupees to $1. The real rate of Sri Lankan rupee should have been much much more than 200 rupees per $1. But they said no, we will only allow maximum of 200 rupees per dollar not more than that. What happened, as I just explained, whenever anyone wanted to go and buy American dollar, no one was ready to sell the American dollar in exchange of Sri Lankan money. Because why would you do that? If you're getting much, much better rate outside Sri Lanka, you'll want to just take it out of Sri Lanka, sell it there. And that is a problem. This is what happens as per the Grisham law. When the government interferes by overvaluing their own currency, they will be left with only their currency in the market and the good money that people want to get their hands on will all go out of the country. That is the Grisham's law. On the other hand, there is something opposite to this as well. There's something called the Deer's law. Deer's law is considered as a reverse of the Grisham law. The reverse means when good money drives out the bad money. How does this happen? When exchange rate between the currency is not fixed and people have the choice to move their currency as it is happening right now. When the governments don't interfere, when the governments say, let the market decide if our currency is good, if it is solid, people will buy. If it is not solid, people will not buy. Let it be. That means the good money will always drive out the bad money. People who support cryptocurrency, Say that cryptocurrency is an example of this. How people are exchanging their own currency with crypto. Many people are trying to buy crypto. Let's say you have $10,000. You want to buy bitcoins. I don't know what the current rate is. I'm sorry, but let's say you want to buy bitcoins. You give your dollar, take the bitcoin. So as per the author, cryptocurrency being bought by the people is a prime example of theirs law. That is... Good money coming in, bad money going out. The reason being as per the author or as per this law, the reason is that cryptocurrency is not regulated by any government. Because it is freely flowing, no one knows the real price, everyone just trades as per the supply and demand. This is the Grisham law and theirs law. Next important news from the front page, an outcome of the G20 summit, although not really a G20 outcome, it's more of an outcome for a few individual countries. You would have read a lot in the news about this in the past few days or so. That is the economic corridor involving India, West Asia and Europe. This is the economic corridor. In simple terms, it's an economic corridor involving India. From West Asia, it's mostly Saudi Arabia and the UAE. From Europe, it's mostly the G7 countries, France, Italy, Germany, etc. that will come in. Now, this is a huge announcement that has come in. It is said that the talks began in 2019. It was the, the UAE leader that had first thought of this idea. He shared it with the US and that is how it has come about. 
Now let's try and understand what is this and what it is not. First of all, it is not counter to China. Please understand this. It's not something that we should think, oh, now China is gone. Now we are everywhere. No, nothing like this is happening. Please understand this. The reason being, if you look at most of the countries that are involved here, UAE, Saudi Arabia and many other G7 countries, they are not Chinese enemies. They are countries which are on good terms with China. They are countries which have had a lot of deals and investments from China. So it's not that they are trying to harm China. Don't look at all these countries or don't look at China from our lens. Look at China from their lens also. None of these countries are trying to shut down China because they are dependent on a lot of Chinese money. What this is, is about improving our own trade. Basically, this will be a joint collaboration between Aramco. Aramco, as you know, is a Saudi company, Saudi government company. By the way, those who don't know, Aramco is said to be the most profitable company in the entire world. Because it is not a public company, so they have not publicly revealed their earnings. They have never publicly revealed that this is how much we earn. But it is said that the day they reveal it, everyone will be surprised because this will be the most profitable company in the entire world. There was a news that it might come in the stock market with a $1 trillion investment, but it did not happen a few years back. Then we have ADNOC. This is the Abu Dhabi national oil company. So this is the UAE's conglomerate and then Indian company. So basically these have come together. It This project will have a lot of things. It will have rail, roll, water connectivity. It will be data connectivity. It will also be connectivity wherein we'll have refinery projects being set up. So it's a huge project, very similar to something like the CPEC. Remember China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that we have read a lot about? Very similar to that, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor where China is connecting their own Xinjiang province to the Gwadar port in Pakistan, where this connectivity project will have a lot of infrastructure. Similar is the project here as well. It will require an investment of about $100 billion. Half of it has already been committed. As I said, the project started in 2019. Now, this particular economic corridor that we are talking about, this is the plan that from India's Mumbai port, we'll have connectivity to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. From there, we will have much better connectivity to the European countries. This is the entire idea. In the European countries also, the almost the entire continent, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and going up to the Arctic Circle as well. This is the entire idea. Now, as I said, please do not think of it as a counter or an opposition to China because most of these countries are on good terms with China. We just saw Iran, Saudi Arabia having a landmark deal negotiated by China. Just because we are not on good terms with China, let's not assume that this is being done anti-China. Secondly, even Chinese have given a statement yesterday welcoming this, saying that it should not be used for politics, but we welcome such an infrastructure. The problem is India before this has not been able to make such a huge infrastructure project. The reason being that these projects require a lot of huge investment. Chinese have their own BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese are able to invest their own money and that is why over 150 countries, over 150 countries have decided to join the Chinese BRI in some capacity or the other. Many European countries even are also part of the BRI, that is Chinese money flowing in. India never had that kind of money, so we never had this kind of a push toward infrastructure projects. But now, this money is coming in through the G7 nations as well, and this is where India, rather than having to invest, India will act as a big market. Because all these countries also want to explore the Indian market. They want their goods to come to India faster. They want India's market to buy their goods. So they are hoping to catch India's market and India is also hoping now to explore this for our own goods. This is an investment being put by Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment called PGII, which the G7 nations had started. The idea was because most countries around the world, especially poor countries that had to build infrastructure, 
they had no option but to take loan from China. Under the Belt and Road Initiative, China was giving cheaper loans. China was giving loans at a much easier, uh, at a much easier process. This is an initiative to tell the nation that you don't have to go to essentially China only to take the loan. You can take a loan from us as well and we will help you with road, rail connectivity, etc. The Chinese loans are not very easy when the Chinese start taking back the money. Chinese always have some kind of a security when they give you the loan. You saw what happened with Sri Lanka. Chinese now have control over the Humban Totapur for 99 years because Sri Lanka is unable to pay the loan. This is an alternative to other countries that you can take loan from us as well. It's also good to know a few details about the PGII that will be bankrolling this project mostly. Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. It's an initiative of the G7 countries. Joe Biden called it the, back, uh, the Build Back Better World. That is a B3W. In simple terms, it's an idea of investing in infrastructure around the world to counter the growth of China's BRI. As per the group, they are expecting that initiative or investment from this group will be about $600 billion by 2027 to improve the lives of the people around the world, helping them connect better and eventually helping their own trade making sure that the world, especially the developing world, is not just dependent on China. See, understand there is a lot of excitement whenever such announcement comes in. But the real outcome of such an investment, the real impact is only seen after a few years. So my suggestion is just not to jump the gun. Good to be excited, good to be optimistic, but let's not be overtly optimistic that something will change all of a sudden now. These projects take a huge, huge amount of time to be built. It's a continuous project that will start and be built in few years coming in. It might take decades. So we'll have to see what the impact is in the long run. It's a very good beginning. India, because for a lot of years, had always been dependent on Pakistan to give us access towards our West. So to go towards our West, we were dependent on Pakistan. Pakistan never gave us the access. So it is good for us that we are getting much more access however finer details still have to be ironed out in this now we have a couple of stories a couple of news from the prelims examination point of view first from the front page that is the cbi news coming in from the supreme court let me tell you in simple terms what the news is basically the CBI is under a law called the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. In this law, there is a section called Section 6A. Section 6A that was inserted in September 2003 says, if CBI has to conduct an inquiry against an officer of joint secretary or higher level, then they would have to ask for the government's permission specifically. They would have to ask for the government's permission. If the government denies the permission, CBI cannot conduct even a preliminary inquiry against officers of Joint Secretary or higher rank. This is what Section 6A says. That Joint Secretary or higher have to be given more protection against them even for a joint inquiry even for a preliminary inquiry cbi first has to ask the government's permission what happened was there was a case in the supreme court in 2014 in 2014 supreme court struck down this section in 2014 supreme court said no this is illegal we cannot have this disparity that lower level officials you can conduct inquiry against higher levels you cannot know this will not happen. So they said we are taking this away. Now what is the issue? The issue is what about those officers of joint secretary or higher against whom the case was registered between 2003 and 14? 2003 the act the section came in saying no inquiry against these officers without the government's permission. 2014, the, government, the Supreme Court said, no, we are removing this. So now the question is, between this, from 2003-2014, to 
if the CBI had to register a case against joint secretaries. Now can they do this or do they still need permission? This was the case. Officers between this, they were saying, no, 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 we will be protected. For us, you require permission of the government. Supreme Court said no. Supreme Court has said that even for officers, before 2014, CBI does not require any permission. Meaning that in simple terms, now this section has been removed since 2003. Whatever cases or whatever complaints came to the CBI against any level of officers, CBI can conduct the inquiry without taking special permission. That is what the order is. Before 2014 also, if there was a complaint registered against a joint secretary or higher level officer, even then they can have this complaint and have the inquiry without the government's permission. Why? Because again, they said that there is no distinction between joint secretary and lower level officials. The secretary said or the officer said that sir under fundamental rights under article 20. Remember we have this law. We have this contract of no ex post facto law. Remember we talk about no ex post facto law. That is the laws cannot come into force from a back date. So officers were saying this should not happen. But Supreme Court said no, this does not apply here. Supreme Court said there is no applicability of this here and you are equal to everyone else. Even before 2014, if the complaint was registered against a joint secretary or above, you cannot have immunity. You will still be investigated by the CBI without any special permission being required. Now the last news, CSIR yesterday after a lot of delay, announced the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize. Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize is, as you know, one of the topmost science prizes in India. This year, about 12 scientists got it below the age of 45. Remember CSIR? CSIR, one of India's topmost scientific research organizations. The prize is named as Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar because he was the first director general of CSIR. It is usually announced on the 26th of September. It has been delayed because this prize that has been announced is for 2022. Not 2023, but 2022. So it's delayed for about an year or so. These are the important people who have won the prize. I am not suggesting you to remember all of them. There is a lower probability, but again, these days, you can't be really sure about what the UPSC are, but these are the people who have won the prize in different categories of engineering sciences, mathematical, physical, medical sciences, earth, atmosphere, etc. A few details about this prize. As I said, it's named after first director general of the CSIR. Also, it is given every year in different fields. As you can see, try and remember these fields at least. Biological sciences, engineering, atmosphere, earth, chemical, medical science, physical, etc. Do remember this part specifically. It is given to a person making contribution in science and technology up to the age of 45, not more than that. Even the overseas citizens of India who are working in India are eligible. And this is on the basis of working for five years before this. So if you contributed or made a breakthrough discovery much earlier, you are not covered. Whatever you did in the last five years is covered. Also, what you get is this cash of 5 lakh rupees and 15,000 per month up to the age of 65 years. This is what you earn if you get awarded this prize. This brings us to the end of today's discussion. These are a couple of practice questions right here for you as always. Try and make sure you use the student's answer writing portal. Get your answers there. Check each other's answers. Give each other feedback to learn from each other's mistakes as well. We'll see you tomorrow again 10 a.m. For the next session of the Hindu News of Analysis, make sure that you go over to our Telegram channel, attend the quiz, revise whatever you have studied and see how many marks have you scored. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Till then, have a good day. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.